welcome to this service of virtual Christian worship. I'm Reverend John Van Nuys. I'm the pastor at Wabash Avenue Presbyterian Church in Crawfordsville, Indiana. On behalf of our entire church family, I'd like to welcome you to this service. Although we are separated spatially from one another due to the pandemic, we are nonetheless together spiritually because the Holy Spirit is present and where two or more are gathered, God is here. So we welcome you and let us now prepare our hearts to come before the Lord in worship. Please join me in our call to worship from Psalm 65. Praise is due to you, O God in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed. O you who answer prayer, to you all flesh shall come. We come to worship you, receive us, redeem us, and accept our gift of praise. Our opening song is sung by our choir director, Jenny Swick. confession. This is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it upon their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. I will forgive their evil deeds and remember their sins no more. In penitence and faith, let us confess our sins to God. Please join me in our prayer of confession. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we can be changed and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us now continue to confess our sins in silence. Receive now the declaration of pardon. Confession is hard. It forces us to take a hard look at ourselves, our weaknesses, and our faults. We often have, in tr have trouble forgiving ourselves and believing that you ever forgive us, O God, but you do. Thank you, O Lord, for your love, your understanding, and for the knowledge that in Jesus Christ, your saving mercy is here for us. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are.
forgiven. Let us join together now in our prayer for illumination. Eternal God, without your light, we are blind. Without your word, we are lost. Without your life, we are dead. Grant us, gracious God, your spirit, so we may receive your truth. Amen. Our scripture today comes from Psalm 78, the first verse, uh, through the first portion of verse 4. So listen now for God's word as it speaks to you. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known and that our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their children. We will tell to the coming generation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In 1969, when I was eight years old, Mom and Dad took me to Seymour, Indiana to see President Eisenhower's funeral train as it passed through Indiana from Washington, D.C. to Abilene, Kansas. The funeral car that carried President Eisenhower's body was entirely black, and there was an American flag on the side. On the way home, Dad told me how President Eisenhower had helped America win World War II. Soon after seeing Eisenhower's funeral train, I came down with the chicken pox and I had to go see our family doctor, Dr. Province. He asked me how second grade was going, but I wanted to talk about and tell him about seeing President Eisenhower's funeral train. Dr. Province surprised me though when he said, I knew President Eisenhower. I was on his medical staff during the war in England when he was General Eisenhower. Really? I, I couldn't believe I was talking to someone who actually knew a president. Yes, really, Dr. Province said. I was one of his doctors. I even played bridge with him. I was trying to figure out what bridge was when Dr. Province turned to my dad and said, people wonder if Ike had an affair. He definitely did. Everybody on his staff knew all about it, but we were smart enough to keep our mouths shut. Years later, I read about Captain K. Summersby, Ike's beautiful married English chauffeur. Seven years after Eisenhower's death, as Summersby was dying of cancer, she wrote a memoir confirming the rumors of their romance. But on the way home that day, I didn't know any of that when I asked Dad, what's an affair? I don't remember what Dad said, but I definitely remember over 50 years what Dr. Province said. I didn't know what an affair was then, but I could tell that it wasn't good. Looking back on that conversation, I guess that was the first time I realized that great men could do bad things. Right now, our nation is coming to terms with that realization as well. As Confederate monuments continue to come down, we are realizing that secessionists aren't the only pro-slavery heroes that we've put on a pedestal. Thomas Jefferson, who wrote in the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal and who owned 300 human beings, has a big monument in Washington, D.C., so does George Washington, who also owned slaves. Twelve American presidents were slave masters. American history is a story about democracy and liberty, about a shining city set high upon a hill. But American history is also a story of how life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness unfolded in a nation 
that exterminated one race to take its land and then enslaved another race to work it. I love our family farm, but it is land that was stolen from the Miami Indian nation that was forcibly removed from it. Like five generations of ancestors before me, I continue to profit from that crime. I love America. I'm proud to be an American. I'm proud that our nation stood up to the evil of Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan to save the world. But I also lament that in so doing, 120,000 loyal Japanese Americans were forced into internment camps. If we're honest, we have to confess that our nation has done great good and great harm. Some tell us that American history contains no crimes, but we all know in our heart of hearts that that is not right. Others tell us that American history contains nothing good, but we all know that that is not correct either. If we're courageous enough to confess that we are not wholly innocent, and if we're wise enough to recognize that we are not wholly evil, then what we will discover is the truth. The truth that our leaders were and are capable of good and bad, as are we. And that our nation has been and is capable of noble deeds and dark deeds, as all nations are. This shouldn't surprise us if we've been reading our Bibles. There is not one hero in the Bible that is perfect. Abraham sent his slave Hagar and their child Ishmael off into the desert with nothing to die. Moses, the bringer of the law, was a murderer. David, Israel's greatest king, committed adultery, and then murder to cover up his crime. The Hebrews as a people both honored and dishonored God. Israel as a nation both obeyed and disobeyed God. Why should we expect to be any different? Aren't we mature enough to admit, to admit that we're not perfect? Aren't we humble enough to confess what we have done wrong? And aren't we good enough to make those wrongs right? Ronald Reagan was when he signed into law legislation providing reparations for the loss of property of Japanese internees, Ronald Reagan courageously rightly said, no payment can make up for those lost years. What is most important in this bill has less to do with property than with honor. For here we admit a wrong, and here we reaffirm our commitment as a nation to equal justice under the law. The Bible tells us the truth. There is right and there is wrong. The Bible tells us the truth. No one is perfect, no one except our Savior. The Bible tells us the truth. No nation is without sin, and there are consequences for sin, but there is also the possibility for repentance and renewal. There are only two nations in world history that have faced the entire truth of their history. South Africa, and Germany. Thank God the evil of apartheid and the evil of Adolf Hitler has been honestly named and rightly renounced. While acknowledging and repenting of their past sins was hard, the result for South Africa and Germany has been good. As we follow their example, and as we look to God by coming to terms with our history, we will form a more perfect union, 
for our children, for the future, and for the world. So, let us embrace the truth that shall set us free. Let us honor God who calls us to love kindness and to do justice and to walk humbly with our God. As we do, God will bless America. Let us pray. Holy God, we come to this day praying for our world, our nation, our community, and those in need. Oh God, we pray for our world during this time of pandemic that you will guide all in positions of authority to lead us all into a day where all are alive and whole and blessed and that we are all past uh, the coronavirus. We pray, Lord, for all essential workers, for all health care providers, for all who are in harm's way providing care for us. Lord, protect them and shield them, we pray. Lord, we pray for our nation. Wherever we are in the right, O oh Lord, help us to continue in that and to expand that good work. And wherever we are wrong, O oh Lord, we pray that you will help us to recognize that wrong and that you will give us the strength and wisdom and courage to work to make it right. Lord, we pray for our community. We ask, Lord, your grace to be poured out through your love by our compassion to make sure that everyone is included in your blessings and love. We pray, Lord, for all who are ill, for all who seek healing in body, mind, and spirit. Pour out upon them your richest blessings. We ask your grace upon all who grieve. Pour out your spirit, your presence, and your peace upon them and walk with them as they mourn toward a brighter day. We ask, Lord, your grace as well upon Alan, Alger, Becky and Jim, Kevin and Laura, Betsy, Betty and Dick, David and Sheridan, Jenny, Jim and his family, Jim and Virginia, Judy, Lily's friend Dakota, Linda and Bill, Lloyd, Marty, Nanette, Roger, and for these additional persons and concerns that we now offer to you in silence. O oh God, we thank you for receiving our prayers and for receiving us as your forgiven, redeemed, and loved children. Unite us now in one voice in the prayer that our Savior taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is sung by Jenny Fight Swick.
receive now the charge and the benediction. I charge all of us to be the change we want to see in our church, in our community, in our state, nation, and world. Let us embrace God's truth and live out God's grace, trusting that as we do, God will grant what is good to us as a nation and as a people and to us all for the blessing of the world. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord turn a shining face toward you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen.